from out of the mist. Written and read by Hugh Carr. Directed by Brendan James. My own true ghost story takes place 17 years ago in the dark and somber, mystical land of Wales. I only ever believed in what we call ghosts as a small child, in the days when the diabolical and supernatural were equal and just as likely as my belief in an afterlife that Luke Skywalker was real and that the shadows in my bedroom at night held hungry creatures made of darkness. I had cast off what I thought of as the primitive superstitions of my ancestors by the time I reached my teens. The world then was made of science, medicine, discovery and sceptical inquiry. Life was what I could see and take hold of. By the age of thirty, my vision of the world was as pragmatic as that of any other materialist. At the time that this account takes place, my family and I lived in Kent in southeastern England. Life ticked by with clear clockwork efficiency, like the weather of that country that was cheerful and mostly sunny. In April of that year, we took one of our regular family holidays travelling west, away from shining, predictable and orderly Kent, and bit by bit made our way towards the land of mists and mountains, of Celtic past and fog-laden future, the ever-intangible land of Wales, or Cymru in the Welsh language, a land haunted by mists, haunted. As a child, I was terrified of that word. Once in my school library, I came across a book called This House is Haunted. It was full of simple, plain photographs and text easy enough for my youthful vocabulary, but the one thing that terrified me the most was the word I had never before heard. Haunted. The sound alone told a child what there was to fear about that word. I have never lost my fear for it. We stayed in a cottage in Nebo, Gwyneth, and used that as a base to roam the countryside, in the shadow of the Snowdon Mountains and the clouds that haunted them. I was with my wife and two infant daughters. When we first entered the charming little holiday cottage, we found the walls of the living room covered in postcards of the area. Beneath many of them, Colin, the cottager's owner, had written small explanations on card. There were references to the dark Iron Age of prehistoric Wales, the legends of King Arthur, and, to my particular interest, references to the strange medieval collection of mythological tales called the Mabinogion. Although heavily Christianized by Welsh monks who recorded the stories in the 12th and 13th centuries, it is impossible to read that book and not glimpse behind the sanitized foreground characters, the deeper pre-Christian Celtic past, with its fear and reverence of the ever-watching natural world, and what we have come to know as the other world. To the Celts, the other world existed in a sort of parallel to our own. 
It was not in the future or in some separate place like the present legend of heaven, but a place you could cross over and inadvertently slip into. Rather than an indolent paradise, it was perilous. Mortals who strayed and did not keep their wits about them would, in the other world, court disaster and their doom. In the west and north of Wales, the other world feels very close. It feels like it is watching. In the ice-cold glacial lakes or lins, one can glimpse strange shapes moving. In the stunted oak forests that huddle in the nooks beneath overhanging mountains, age-old eyes watch. Of this I am certain now. So I was standing in the sheltering warmth of the living room, whilst my youngest daughter crawled on the floor and my eldest danced about her for her amusement, and I spoke with Colin about the sights to see in and about the mountains and valleys. Colin learned from my wife and I that we had a keen interest in Romano-Celtic Britain, as well as the Neolithic and Iron Age. Oh, then you definitely have to go and look at this place, he said, and pointed to a particular postcard on the wall. I looked to the photograph and read the small legend that he had written beneath it. Tre Kerry? Iron Age Hill Fort? Yes, that's the place, he said. It's the best example of a Celtic settlement not only in Wales, but possibly all of Western Europe. There are over a hundred stone houses, some parts with walls three or four metres high. But you have to be careful around there. It is a rough climb, and it can get pretty boggy at this time of the year. We chatted a bit more, and he pointed out where to find it on our map. It was close to twenty miles away by road, on a mountain top. When he had left for the evening and returned to his cottage next door, my wife reminded me to be careful of my health. We had started the holiday with a relapse of the illness that had frequently plagued me over the past few years. Fever, pain, and flu-like symptoms that would often send me to bed for a week or more at a time. It had grown worse through our married life together, yet neither of us knew how ill I actually was. I was in fact suffering from a condition that, if left untreated, would lead to organ failure and eventually my death. All I knew at the time was that I seemed to get more sick than anyone else when the seasonal flu came around, and it depressed me. Because of this, I promised her that if I went exploring in the countryside the next day to find these stone huts of the ancients, that I would do everything I could not to exacerbate the illness that we felt was creeping up on me again. I woke in the morning feeling poorly, but hid it from my wife. We set out and travelled north to Penigroes, and from there southwest to the Llyn Peninsula, the arm of North Wales that juts out into the Irish Sea, dominated by volcanic hills and mountains. The dwellings scattered about were small and simple, made from local stone, and dwarfed by the spectacular shapes of the trident-like formation of mountains known in Welsh as Ur Eifel. Rain spattered the windshield, turning the landscape an iron grey of old swords. The mountains loomed on the horizon, huge, jagged-backed and ominous, 
like a sleeping dragon. In the village of Klinogvaur, we stop to see the sacred well of 7th century Celtic saint Bueno, the church that had seen Viking raids in the 10th century, and a Neolithic Kromlech, a prehistoric table-like burial structure made from three massive fingers of heavy rock balancing a slab on top, purported to be some four to six thousand years old. The burial chamber was reached by following a laneway behind the church, crossing the road and entering the fields by the sea. Sheep had the mastery of the space, and when I saw the Cromlech crouching darkly in the field, lambs were gambling between its three roughly shaped walls. As I sat beside it, the weight of years fell on me, like I was inside and the great rock roof was pressing down. Who were the people who lived, worked, worshipped, and died here then? What would they think of us, the aftercomers? Would they see us as their descendants? or unwanted invaders usurping their land that had suckered them since the last ice age. It was like they were watching still. A voice cried out, Go away, in a harsh bleat. But it was only the sound of a lamb nearby, frightened by our presence. Returning to the village, we met a local man named David, propping up the fence in his front yard, who invited us into his home for afternoon tea. My youngest daughter charmed a second helping of biscuits out of him, and she sat on the tiled kitchen floor, happily chewing her biscuits to oblivion as the sun began to show her golden-haired face in the slate sky. Seeing an opportunity to make the most of the weather, we bade David farewell and continued on into the south. Closer and closer, the trident mountains grew, drawing us in. No other cars passed us on the road, and no cottages marred the deep greens, purple and grey of the patchwork fields that spread beneath the peaks of ur -Evel. A side road led us through the village of Llithvain, and at last north behind the mountain to a small car park beside an intensely black fir forest called Nant Guthéren. My wife and I got out of the car and let the children play on the forest's verge. The shadows within were so deep and black that it was impossible to see, even in the daytime, more than a score of yards ahead. As I walked with my eldest daughter between the boughs of the trees, a sea mist began to snake its way through the forest, floating like a silver serpent. My daughter and I both thought the same thing, saying it aloud. It could be the breath of the Dragon of Wales, Thregoch, hidden somewhere in the deeper shadows. Now, my wife is not a climber. She often feels shaky standing on a stepladder. She decided to drop me off on the western seaward side of the mountain and take the children to Carnavon for ice cream. We made plans for me to have a couple of hours to climb and then for me to return down the western slope to meet her again in the car park by the forest. She set off as I took the track to the east between the bracken, naked heather and scattered bushes of gorse. I watched the dark shape of our Ford estate disappear south down the track until she turned to take the way to the road that would lead her east of the mountain. 
I stared at the slope ahead of me and set a brisk pace, plunging into my climb. I thanked Providence that I had sturdy hiking boots, for, as Colin had said, the ground was marshy. Up the mossy slope, I found the emerald grass inhabited by shining obsidian slugs that crawled effortlessly within a minuscule world of delicate, translucent fungi that looked like fairy umbrellas. Ten minutes on, and I found the going hard work. I was still ill and out of climbing condition. Often the wet ground slipped out from under me. At its steepest parts, where the grass gave way to grey slate, I was bent almost double. A hare bolted out from a hiding hole between the rocks and zipped up over a hill shoulder in five seconds flat. I found myself envying his powers. Here and there were scattered strangely shaped outcrops of rock. In the clarity of the sunlight, they were interesting. If they had reared up out of the gloom in fog or twilight, I would have shunned them. Everywhere I looked, there seemed to be twisting, enigmatic trails of stones, winding their way among the bracken and the denser bushes of gorse. Gorse, when it is bedecked with golden flowers in later April, is a delight. It fills the air with a smell which is something of a mix between coconut, vanilla, and banana, yet now it was just an encumbrance. It cut at my ankles with its sharp spikes and seemed to clump together in low walls that barred my way. It became impossible to keep in a straight line. The going was hard. I looked at my watch and found that an hour had quickly passed. The sky, which had earlier cleared, was again beginning to darken. On a good day, one could see far from the summit. In the sea to the north is the island of Inesmon, the last refuge of the Druids, before Julius Caesar invaded the island and exterminated their cult from the world. To the north, beyond Inesmon, the Isle of Man, and to the west, Ireland. Not this day. On this day, the sky was for the darkening. There was no truly established walking track. I wound my way between outcrops of rock and sharp gorse borders, avoiding the summit which rose as an enormous conical mound of stones perched on the brown-skinned mountain top like a swollen nipple. Bit by bit, I seemed to be being directed towards a raised circle of stones, where one sharp monolith stood out, pointing accusingly at the umbered sky. That is when I felt the first pulsing pangs of being afraid. Looking back, I do not now know what led me to feel the ill ease that was drawing on me. Perhaps out in this land of my ancestors, I was discerning signs in the weather that my modern senses were oblivious to. I stood in the haphazard stone ring or stockade, the empty countryside all around me whispering its wish for me to be gone. And then, like a behemoth crawling over the summit, storm clouds from the sea turned the sky black. In seconds, the peak disappeared in the thick grey fog. The way I had come was swallowed up and ceased to be. Alone in that place, I remembered all too well 
how the perilous way to the other world was often found in mist. As the fog thickened, I looked at my watch. I had an hour to get back to my rendezvous with my wife at the car park, but I was now on the eastern side of the mountain, and the way back to the car was on the western side, in the mist. Remembering how difficult it had been forcing my way between the clusters of gorse bushes, I dreaded that way. So I turned and looked down the mountain slope to the east. For the moment, it was clear. I could see down the slope over the moor to the road almost a mile away. I turned and looked back to the summit. The cloud was spilling more thickly now. The first tendrils of it were weaving about me. In minutes, I would be lost within it. There was no sense trying to return the way I had come, I reasoned. In some desperation, I formed a new plan. I would descend down the mountain to the moors below, making my way to the main road. It was the way that my wife would have to come to return to the track to the car park, and I had some chance that I might be able to see and signal her as she approached. But even as I thought these thoughts and began determining my path, I noticed with some despair what I had hitherto overlooked. Amidst the dark brown of the bracken and heather, were wide swathes of bright, iridescent green that stood out like gangrenous growths on dead flesh. I had read The Hound of the Baskervilles. I knew them for what they were. They showed where ever-creeping water from the mountain stood and gathered in dark pools, turning field into marsh and mire. In increasing fog, a path in that direction would be foolish, if not suicidal. And now, real fear began to gather in my mind. The great stone shapes sliding into mists seemed to mock my peril. The countryside I loved shifted. It stumbled parallel to the landscape I sought to heal me into a dark, ageless thing that hated my kind. The fog deepened and began to fill in the way ahead of me. That is when I saw them. As I scanned the myriad ways down, seeking for signs that might aid me in avoiding the dangerous mire if I became lost in the fog, I saw, standing in an open patch of grass in the middle of nowhere, two distinct shapes. Against the green of the grass I saw them, a man with a large dog beside him. Even as I saw them, something in my instinct shivered. At first I did not notice what would later scare me and has returned to haunt me on countless nights. When I saw them, I waved my hands frantically, desperate to attract their attention. I shouted out slowly and as distinctly as I could, hoping my words would cross the half mile or so between us. Help me! I'm lost! Is it safe to come your way? But then I was forgetting where I was. I was in the part of Wales where many spoke English only as a second language. Suddenly thankful for Welsh lessons, I shouted again. How poor we chwi os gwerchynda? Ruin our goll. To this, the man, 
if man he was, responded. He gave no spoken reply. With a slow, deliberate movement, he raised both of his long arms, as dark to my eyes as the rest of him, and made an unmistakable sign. Come to me, he waved with his arms. The dog did not move. It stayed beside him, staring up towards me. A shiver that had nothing to do with the icy breath of the sea fret at my back passed through me. I had suddenly realized that the black as it seemed wolf-like dog at his side, was enormous, something of the size of a great Dane or larger, and even as its immense bulk jostled its way into my conscious mind, I found myself wondering, what the hell are they doing out there, just standing in the middle of nowhere and looking up the mountain? There was no walking track to where they were. They were too far from the road to have come that way, and besides, there was a high hedge all along the roadside that looked impassable. It was as if they had sprung up out of the ground itself from among the long-forgotten stone ruins. He signalled on, but still made no sound that I could hear, no call, no cry out to reassure me that he could see my situation and knew the best and safest path. All too quickly, the clouds folded in around me, claiming me for themselves, and I was left to stumble my way on in a grey suffocating gloom. Now cut off from the man, I found the feeling of my own body, its fatigue, was taking over. I felt hot, though I was readily shivering. My sickness was growing, and the cold, wet, and fright were all adding to it. Every once in a while I was distracted by a bite of gorse slicing into my flesh, forewarning that there were perils here that I had been foolish to treat with such naive disdain. Through it all, though, I had one hope. I was sure I was following in the right direction where the strange, solitary man had signaled. Handfuls of minutes raced by, and I seemed no closer to escaping the mountainside or the cloud. Instead, a great, dark shape began to grow ahead and below me. With a sinking feeling of horror, I feared I was heading straight for a great morass of choking mire. At any moment I may slip on the wet ground and suddenly find myself pitched forward headlong into a dark, grinning moor. I found myself too terrified of what dark things may rise up out of the choking water to draw me down into a final, deep embrace. However. The darkness did not turn out to be a mire or an icy mere of black water. Instead, a wide stretch of gorse was before me, in some places waist high. Staring into the fog on either side of me, I wondered if I should try to circumvent it. But might that not lead me? once I came down off the raised portions where the gorse hung onto solid earth, to the sucking mud, or worse. It seemed I had no choice but to press ahead. Finding a path through the gorse was agony. 
I played a horrible, blind game of leaping over lower portions into unknown ditches and troughs. I was stabbed in the shins and in the thighs, and sometimes I had no choice but crawl astride the bushes so that the barbs bit through my jeans and scraped at my groin. I was swearing, sweating and shivering, hating the hillside and the man who had drawn me this way. However, through all this anguish, something was calling to me in the back of my mind. There was something terribly wrong. I scanned the emptiness, wondering what was making my primitive senses scream at me. Then it came to me. There was something wrong beneath my feet. I had been so fixated and frustrated by the pain of fighting through the gorse that I had not noticed the strange shifting sensation under my boots. Some instinct I barely understood made me bend down to ground level and despite the plant slicing at my fingers, clear some of the foliage away. When I saw what lay beneath the plants at my feet, my back instantly became wet with cold sweat. As I realized, where I was. The gorse had grown completely over a field of blades. They were not the swords of the forgotten folk whose long lost bodies had sunk into the soil, but razor sharp daggers of slate and granite pointing upwards. My feet had sensed the ground shifting below me. Now I could see the land ahead of me dipped suddenly. If I continued on this path, I would no doubt end myself by pitching headlong onto points that would slice me open, finding arteries and leaving me to bleed out like a slaughtered pig. And the man... He had seen the way between me and him. He had seen the field of stone blades. And he had beckoned me on. For a moment, I was full of rage. Why? Why would he do this? What had I done to him? I had called out for his aid in need, and he had looked and seen the cloud coming in behind me, knowing I would soon be lost in it. He had purposefully drawn me towards a place where I would, if not just break a leg, possibly sacrifice myself. Sacrifice. Hadn't I once read that Caesar's reason for hunting out the druids on Innismon was to destroy their cult of human sacrifice? A horror I have never before felt gripped me. In our day and age, sacrificing people would almost be impossible. If you desperately wanted to keep your ancient traditions alive and kill a living human to give to your dark gods, you would get caught. But what if you did not do the killing yourself? What if you let the land take its own blood? Was the man out there still ahead of me somewhere, waiting in the mist? Was he seeking my sacrifice? Or was he instead some remnant of those long dead people, an inhabitant of the other world who had crossed over through the mists and come to bring ruin to those who trespassed on the last home of his fellow shades. 
Suddenly, the way ahead of me was too terrifying to dare. I turned and began a frantic, desperate struggle back up the mountain slope. Once or twice, I glanced behind, a growing dread that I would see a tall, haunted shape pursuing behind me began to grow, with a great, black, wolf-like thing at his side, hunting me. Somehow, I found a solid shoulder of the mountain, and instead of climbing back over the western slope, skirted around the mountain to the south. At last I met with a walking track, and although I was over an hour late, saw my wife's car waiting with the lights on full beam to direct me back to the car park. I almost fell into the car, weak with gratitude to have made it back and see my young family again. Yet, I was not prepared for the next shock that awaited me. When I got to the car, my wife was white-faced and wide-eyed. At first I thought she'd been worried for my sake, fretful that I might be lost on the mountain. She had warned me not to get caught in bad weather, and here I was staggering out of the mists, looking like a half-drowned rat. But that was not the reason. With doors closed and locked inside the car, she told me what had frightened her. She had got to the car park early, in time to see the sea storm rolling in and covering the mountainside. Concerned, she had waited until the time I was supposed to get back to the car, peering into the mist in the hope of seeing me. Close to our arranged rendezvous time, she had seen a shape emerge from out of the mist. Two shapes. She had known it was not me within a heartbeat. The first shape to come out of the mist approached the car and stared through the windshield at her, saying nothing was a tall man dressed in grey. She said his face had seemed as grey as the ragged cloak or covering he had dragged about him. And out of the fog beside him, straight out of a nightmare, came a great black dog. For long moments he had stared at her, she locked the doors. Still saying nothing, he turned and was eaten up again by the fog. That had been an hour before I had made it back to the car, around the same time that I had seen him summoning me on the far side of the mountain. She and I have never told this story. Two years later, on the anniversary of this event, I collapsed in my home. By good fortune, my brother came by and found me unconscious on the floor and rang an ambulance. After weeks of recovery in hospital, I had an operation that opened me up to find the source of my illness. I remember waking up and the surgeon telling me that he was dumbfounded at the twisting growths that he had spent hours cutting away from my organs. I couldn't help thinking they were just like the strangling gorse that had tried to snag me and draw me down into the darkness. The surgery cured me of that darkness within my body. However, it was from this time on that another darkness has never left me. I feel it when I am alone and despairing. It waits for me ever just beyond my sight. 
much like the great black dog in the mists did. It has been waiting now for 17 years. I feel it very close. If you have ever wondered why we chose to call this collection of stories the Black Dog Chronicles, this is the story that explains it. So, if one day there are suddenly no more stories here, and you do not hear from me again, he has at last come out from the mist. This edition of the Black Dog Chronicles is now available on Bandcamp. You can be the first to own this story and more. Please support our channel by purchasing a copy and telling your friends. If you don't purchase a copy, please remember, we know where your grandparents live. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Press the notification bell to be up to date with every new story. And as always, look out for the monsters. <laughs>